Welcome back to chapter 7. Today we're going to look at 7.5, which deals with work. Um, we have two objectives with this section. We're going to look at two different types of work, one being the work that's done by a constant force and one being done um, by a variable force. Now, work is important to people like engineers and scientists um, because sometimes it is necessary to find the amount of energy that's required to perform different types of jobs. So first, let's start out by looking at the work done by a constant force. Now, generally, work is done, or work is done any time a force moves an object. If you apply a force to an object and it's constant, then the definition of work is given by um, work, which is W, is equal to the force times your displacement or the distance that it has traveled. And again, this is when your force is constant. Typically, work is thought, or I'm sorry, force is thought of as a push or a pull, okay? And it's a push or pull that will change the state of a motion of a body, okay? So if it's something that's at rest and it has a force applied to it and then be, goes to moving, or if it's something that's already moving and all of a sudden a force is applied and it stops it, that's um, kind of what a force is doing. There's several different types of forces. You have centrifugal, um, electromotive, gravitational. Um, any type of a force that you can think of that would move an object. Um, now, when we deal with gravity or the gravitational forces, okay, a lot of times it's common to use measurements that correspond to the weight of an object. Now, if we look at example one, it says determine the work done in lifting a 50-pound object four feet up. Okay, and over here we have a diagram of that. Okay, we have some 50-pound object. In this case, it looks like it's being lifted probably by a crane or something like that. And we're going to pick it up a distance of 4 feet. Now, again, we're assuming that we have a constant force of 50 pounds. So with that, I know that we said that work was equal to force times displacement. So in this case, I would just have to go in and plug in what I know. I know that my force is equal to 50 pounds and I know that my displacement or my distance traveled is going to be equal to 4 feet. So 50 times 4 is 200 foot pounds. And this here would be the work that's required to lift that 50 pound object 4 foot up. In the US, typical units of um, work are usually foot pounds, inch pounds, or foot tons. Um, in the centimeter gram second system, okay, the typical unit is called a dyne. Okay, but I think we're probably going to be looking at more so like the newton meters, which a newton meter is equal to a joule. Um, and sometimes you'll see ergs. Um, ergs are actually related to joules as well. But I think most of the applications that you'll probably see will deal with either the foot pounds or I would say the newton meter slash joule. The next type of work we're going to look at is when work is being done by a variable force. Now, if an object is being moved along a straight line by a force that's continuously varying, then we say that the work done by the force is equal to the integral from A to B of the function or the varying force um, dx. There's three basic um, laws that are used when using variable forces. Um, the first one is called Hooke's Law and this kind of deals with compressing or stretching a spring um, and what that says is that force is equal to some value k and k is our what we call the constant of proportionality or the spring constant Okay, so force is equal to K times D, and um, this, it actually changes depending on um, what type of a spring we're dealing with, and we will do an example with this so that you can see what this looks like. The next type of variable force deals with Newton's law of universal gravitation. Um, that's given by force is equal to K, which again is a proportionality constant, times M1, M2, which are two different masses, divided by d squared, and the d is actually the distance that's between those two particles. And the third um, basic law that we're going to deal with is Coulomb's law, and that's force is equal to that same k value, or that constant, 
um, times Q1, Q2, which are actually the charges um, in a vacuum, divided by d squared, and d is also the distance between the two charges. So if we look at example two, it says a force of 750 pounds compresses a spring three inches from its natural length of 15 inches. We want to find the work done in compressing the spring an additional three inches. Okay, and this is in addition to the um, amount that it's already been compressed. So if you look at the diagram over here in the bottom corner, you'll see that this is my natural spring. Okay, this is a spring at rest with nothing touching it. A force has been applied and it says a force of 750 pounds has been applied just to compress this spring these three inches. And it looks like, if you notice down over here, like your spring is, be, is fixed to something. So I'm compressing or squishing this spring three inches. Now what we want to do is we want to find the amount done to compress it an additional three inches right here. And if you've ever tried to compress a spring, you'll see that it gets harder and harder um, to compress it with the the more it's um, being compressed and we'll actually prove that here mathematically now because we are dealing with springs we're going to deal with Hooke's law and if you recall Hooke's law said F or the force is equal to K X now I know that my F of 3 inches is equal to 750 pounds so I can use that information to solve for my K value so 750 pounds was equal to K times my distance of 3. So to solve for K, I'm going to take and divide everything by 3. And I have 750 divided by 3, which is really 250. So if I go back and solve for F, I have F equals 250X. Now what I've just done is I have found the function of f or my force. And remember, functions vary depending on what I plug in for x. So this is why I'm using um, the variable force, or the, the work equation that deals with variable force. Now, we know that work is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x dx. In this case, I'm compressing my spring. It tells me um, I'm already, I've already compressed it three inches, but I want to do another three inches. So I'm going to start out at three inches, and I'm going to go another three inches. So three inches plus another three is going to give me six inches. So I'm going to integrate from three to six of f of x, which we just found to be 250x dx. When I simplify that, I integrate that, and I end up with 125x squared. And I'm going to evaluate that from 3 to 6. When I plug all of that in, I end up with 3,375 inch pounds of work to compress that spring an additional three inches from what it already was. And if you notice, that's quite a bit more than the original 750 pounds that it took to compress it the first three inches. Now another way to look at work done by variable forces um, is to look at how the work is being calculated. We can either take a force and multiply it by a distance increment or a change in distance, or we can calculate work with a force increment or a changing force multiplied by a set distance. Now when we're dealing with fluids or chains, we'll see that this interpretation here is typically an easier one to use. And that's actually what our next example um, deals with. So example three says, a spherical tank of radius eight feet is half full of oil that weighs 50 pounds per cubic foot. We want to find the work required to pump the oil out through a hole in the top of the tank. So I have this spherical tank here that's filled halfway full of oil, and I want to push all of this oil up and out this tiny hole in the top. Now from a calc perspective, what we're really looking at doing is we are looking at taking and slicing this into a little tiny section, okay? 
So I've got this section that I'm going to push up, and I'm going to increment. So I'm going to have several of these tiny little slices. Because that's changing, as I push my um, each little section up, my, my force is going to change. So I end up with a change in force really is going to equal the weight that I'm having to push. Okay, and I get that change in force by taking the force that's given to me, and I, I was given that I had 50 pounds per cubic foot. So I have 50 pounds per cubic foot, and I have to get that in just a unit of force. Well, the thing, just looking at your units here, I see that I have cubic feet in the denominator, which means that I have to multiply a unit of cubic feet in the numerator. Well, cubic feet to me is a volume. So I'm going to have to take the volume of this little disk over here, and that's actually what I'm going to multiply that by. So if I multiply <clears throat> my 50 um, pounds per cubic foot by the volume of that little disk that I'm going to be pushing up, I know that the volume of the disk is equal to pi r squared, which in this case is going to be x, so pi x squared times whatever my thickness is of this little disk, which I'm going to call dy. So what I end up with is a variable force that's equal to 50 times pi x squared dy. And I'm just going to hold this off to the side here for just one second. Now because I'm dealing with a sphere or a circle, okay, I know that my radius is 8 because it tells me that I have a radius of 8 feet. So I have a circle with a radius that is equal to 8 feet. And I'm going to just center it. at 0, 8. I also know that the equation for a circle is given by x squared plus y squared and in this case my y value is really going to be the distance from the center to the um, top. So if I look at the center of my circle as being here at 0, 8 and I go and if I go anywhere to the outside of that circle, I see that I'm really going a distance of 8. So for my y value, I really have y minus 8, and that value is going to be squared, and that's equal to my radius squared, which was 8 squared. So if I simplify this, I have x squared plus y squared minus 16y plus 64 equals 64. Now I want to get x by itself. So I have x squared is equal to a negative y squared plus 16y um, and then my 64's will cancel out. Now this right here is an x squared value and I have an x squared value up here. So what that tells me is I can now go in and substitute my change in f. I have 50 times pi x squared I just solved as 16y minus y squared and I still don't know what dy is so I'm going to leave that as dy. Now, if we remember, work is equal to delta F times your displacement. Well, in this case, when I look at my displacement, my disk is starting down here at the bottom. So if I start down here at the bottom, if I have a radius of 18, that tells me that this whole height here is really going to be equal to 16. So anywhere where I move this disk, I'm really going to move a distance of 16 minus the y value, which then tells me that I can rewrite 
my work equation as I know my force is equal to 50 pi times 16y minus y squared and I'm going to multiply that by my, I'll have my dy and then I also have my distance. In this case we said distance was equal to 16 minus y. I'm also going to integrate this. My limits of integration are going to be from my center all the way up and we're, we said our center started out at 0 and I'm going to push this up a height of 8. So I'm integrating from 0 to 8. So when I simplify this, I have the integral from 0 to 8. My 50 pi is going to be the constant. So I can pull that out up front. When I FOIL the 6y minus y squared by the 16 minus y, I end up with 256y minus 32y squared plus y cubed dy. And when I integrate this, I end up with 50 pi times 128y squared minus 32y cubed divided by 3 plus y to the fourth divided by 4 and I'm going to evaluate that from 0 to 8. When I do that, you will see that it takes 589,782 foot-pounds of work to move that. Our last example says a 20-foot chain weighing 5 pounds per foot is lying coiled up on the ground. We want to know how much work is required to raise the end of the chain to a height of 20 feet so that it's fully extended. You'll have to excuse my fancy drawing here, but essentially what this is is if I have a chain that's coiled up, kind of like I have over here, okay, and I take, if I were to take this end and pull it straight up so that when I was done, this chain was fully extended into a straight line. Now, if you think about this, if you pick one end of that chain up, you're going to pick up the first foot, and it's going to weigh 5 pounds. You're going to pick it up another foot, and it's going to weigh 10 pounds. You're going to pick it up another foot, it's going to weigh 15 pounds. We have a 5 pound per foot chain that's laying there, and it's, if you can envision this, it's getting heavier and heavier as we get it pulled up higher and higher, because eventually I'm going to have all the weight of that chain, um, and I'm going to have to have work to offset how much or how heavy that chain is. So this is kind of what we're dealing with here for a problem. So to set this up, I want to take my work equation, and I know that work is equal to force times my displacement. Now, my force up here, the 5 pounds per foot, is changing. So I am dealing with a variable force, and I'm still multiplying it by a displacement. That variable force is really equal to 5 pounds per foot and I'm going to have to multiply it by some distance and because I'm pulling it in the y direction or the vertical direction I'm just going to call that dy. So when I simplify this I see that I end up with the equation 5 dy times my distance in the y direction, whether it be 1 foot, 10 foot, 20 foot, however long, is y. So this is really equal to 5y dy. So now when I integrate this, so this is my work, is equal to the integral of, I'm integrating this from a distance of 0 to 20 feet. And I'm going to integrate the function, which we said was 5y dy. So this is going to give us 5y squared oops, divided by 2 and when we evaluate that from 0 to 20, 
we end up with 1,000 foot pounds. So it's going to take 1,000 foot pounds to lift that 20 foot chain that weighs 5 pounds per foot. And I'm going to lift that so that it's 20 feet or that it's fully extended. And this is the last example of section 7.5.